So that yeah, sure. So like I said, one of the things that uh, I'm really concerned about here is your ability to sort out um, how your digestive system works and also how it doesn't work. And uh, unfortunately, today um, there's a lot of that, like how it doesn't work. Um, and one of the ways that we see that a lot is in how we see different types of um, dieting things that will pop up and, and people will recommend different diets. And if you can, if you understand how the digestive tract works, you can sort out the nonsense and, and save yourself the time and effort of trying stupid things. Um, so throughout this, we'll talk about different sorts of fad diets that have popped up. Um, they used to be a little more concentrated, where like everybody was doing one thing at one time and they were super popular. Now it's, it's kind of scattered out, where there's a bunch of different ones all at the same time. Um, the first one we'll talk about today is um, one from a, about a decade ago, but it, it makes it comes and goes, and, and it's called the HCG diet. So if you remember, about I don't know, it's probably been ten years. Um, people were pushing HCG drops. You could go to Market Street in Lubbock, and they were at the counter, a little bitty bottle of HCG drops, and you could take this. Um, the idea being that. Um, you would take this and reduce your calories and your fun. All right, so first of all, what is HCG? HCG is a hormone that we're going to come back to again. Isn't that the pregnancy hormone? That's the pregnancy hormone. Um, this is what gives you two lines of the pregnancy test. And uh, we'll talk about its function during pregnancy and how we need the reproduction. As prescribed originally, the way this diet worked was you injected HCG and you went on a 500 calorie a day diet. Are you going to lose weight? Yeah, because you're starving. Yes, because you're starving. That's right. And th you don't even need the injection. 500 calories a day? Yeah, you're going to lose weight. <laughs> if you, so if you're getting the HCG, yes. But here's what happened. When you could go buy this at United, you weren't, in, you weren't injecting yourself with anything. And that's because um, when this, and like I said, it, it kind of makes the rounds. But like in the 70s when this was, was making sort of its second round, um, there was, they created a shortage of real HCG. And like actual HCG is used by your obstetrician. It's, it's uh, injected in women that are prone to miscarriage. And HCG levels should, should increase exponentially during pregnancy up to a point. And if they're not, it's a bad sign. So that often they'll give you HCG to try to keep that pregnancy stable. Well, they created a shortage of it in the 70s. And then when it came back in the 2000s-ish, um, people started promoting homeopathic HCG. All right, so that word, homeopathic. All right, so when you see that, what, is, what do you think? What does that mean? Um, same something. Same pathology. Right, so same. And, and pathology is? Like disease. Disease. So today when you see like homeopathic stuff, like it's promoted, it's like it's all natural, whatever. This is mostly true. But the idea of homeo homeopathy in general is the idea, it's called like treats like. Uh, fight fire with fire. And while this is like a way oversimplified example, you have someone that has insomnia and you give them crystal meth. And maybe they'll cancel each other out. But when, when this idea popped up, Okay, um, it didn't work, right? And it's not, obviously they're not giving people with insomnia and math, but when the idea popped up, you had a, uh, some sort of malady and then you, know, you found something that mimicked those symptoms and they gave the patient, it didn't make anything any better, it made it worse. And okay, fine, that's science, like we learned that. But that's not actually what happened. At this point, he's like, well, I've given them too much. Cut it back. I'm still giving them too much, cut it back. Cut it back, cut it back. And then we get to the idea of what homeopathy is today. Today, homeopathy is based on the idea of what's called serial dilution. Serial dilution is when you dilute a substance to the point that none of it can be detected in your solution. So you take, for instance, like a grain of salt, and you put it in a gallon of water, you shake it up, and then you take a drop out of that gallon of water, and you put it in another one, and you shake it up, and you do that, you know, uh, 100 million more times. Um, so that when you're left, like that grain of salt that you started with, there's no way to detect that anymore. Um, the idea of 
homeopathic things is that when you first put that in whatever solution it is, whether it's water or sugar or whatever, that molecules have some sort of energetic imprint. Um, so there's absolutely no science for this. Um, there's no, like clinically, there's no different. If you go buy homeopathic medications on the shelf, you can take it all. They just drop the whole box or the bottle or whatever, you're fine. Uh, the, only, the only exception to that is if it's homeopathic and it's, got, it's, it's an ethanol, then you don't know, want to watch that because it's usually like 90 proof. That's good cough syrup, but it um, has nothing to do with anything. There are lots of um, weird homeopathic things like that oxylococcinium that they sell for the flu. That's a homeopathic medication. Um, I saw an interview with the lady from the, the French lady, it's a French company that makes it, and they interviewed her about it. They're like, is it dangerous? And he's, she's like, how can it be dangerous? There's nothing in it. By definition, there's nothing in it. There can't be anything in it if it's homeopathic. If there's something in it, it can't be homeopathic. Like, that's the rule. So those are just sugar tablets. They're also expensive, but they're sugar tablets. They're not gonna help your flu. Um, the HCG thing, same thing. Like um, really obscure ingredients. And if they ever started with HCG, what, what you're left with does not have any HCG within it. So what they're selling at the counter, like at Market Street, they were little bottles of water. So we thought of this. Um, the HCG thing, so homeopathy is from the 1800s, and it has stuck around despite repeated um, experiments to show that there's nothing to it at all. Like, it's still stuck around. There's no scientific basis for homeopathy at all. Um, right? If water contained, like, an energetic imprint, we'd all be in trouble because water comes in contact with lots of stuff, like in the ocean, sewage processing plants, the whole water cycle. Yeah, we don't need that, so um, it doesn't. Um, so the HCG thing, though, happened like 50s, 60s, um, I don't remember when. Uh, this British physician um, had this hypothesis that if they injected the patients with HCG, they could comfortably subsist on that 500 calorie a day diet. Right now, if you go on a 500 calorie a day diet, you're gonna be freaking starving. You're super hungry. Well, the idea here was that you inject this and you're not hungry. Like, you, you're fine. Like, you're not going to be complaining about it. And he based that on um, some studies done in, like, developing countries where you had pregnant women that were malnourished but not necessarily complaining about it, I guess. And... Um, and then fat was being redistributed from the, the malnourished pregnant woman to the, the developing fetus. And that idea was that it was HCG that was doing that. Well, as we'll get to with development, HCG levels don't just keep going up throughout pregnancy. There's a point where they're going to go back down because of a different hormone. And we'll talk about that when we get to um, pregnancy. There's no scientific evidence for HCG, even if it's not homeopathic. Homeopathic, it's just water anyway. But even if they were injecting you with HCG, there's no science for this. Um, 500 calories a day, you, you're starving, and you might actually start losing proteins or organs. If they're injecting you with HCG, like if you've got a doctor that will do this, you'll have other effects because it acts like a hormone called luteinizing hormone, and there's some other side effects of this. Um, this got bad enough in like the 2010s that in 2009, the American Society of Bariatrics Physicians threatened censure for any doctors who were actually injecting patients with real HCG. Because there's no, there's nothing for this. The, the medical literature says this is bad and you risk losing your license if you did this. Um, in 1976, when this was making one of its rounds and they created a shortage of HCG, uh, HCG, the FDA slaps this label on the medication that your OB has. If they have to inject with HCG, this is written on it, just in case they're thinking about it. So why did it, it come up again? Well, it, it, it came up again in like the 2010s because a guy published a book and it was sort of focused on this. In 2011, all those drops that were all over the counter, the FDA said they're unapproved drugs, they're illegal. Um, not just because they don't do anything, but because they're not even following the rules of homeopathy. Like, there are rules for this. Like, you actually have to start with HCG and go through that serial dilution. Um, to do that, you can't just sell water. And that's what people apparently were doing, especially online. The FDA, however, was not going to police that as nobody was going to be poisoning. That's not their job. So in 
So it's still around because in 2007, this guy wrote a book called The Weight Loss Cure They Don't Want You to Know About. I don't know who they are, but they want you to be fat. It's like McDonald's. Conglomeration of fast food restaurants, like the fast food Illuminati. Um, so yeah, they, they want you to be fat. And um, he popularized this, and this violated so many different things. He ended up getting fined like $34 million. I think he got jail time over this too. Um, it got ugly. But in the meantime, people bought this book. Like it made the rounds, like it was on, like, and this is the same way, like once it gets in media, like it's really hard to take that back. And in the meantime, people were charging, people got 70, 80 bucks an ounce for what was water. I can remember seeing it at Market Street, like on the counter there, like you check out, it was $40 a bottle. And it, I mean, it was just, you know, an ounce of water with an eyedropper. At that point, I was super frustrated because I didn't think of it. And I could have been making a lot of money. Um, when professional athletes use HCG, it's to keep their testicles from shrinking in between bouts of anabolic steroids. Steroids give you testicular atrophy. HCG will stop that. So, yeah, like, it's happened a lot. Man, look how look how serious like Major League Baseball takes cheating. Fifty games. Look how serious the NFL takes cheating. Eh, four games. Yeah. Okay. Four games. Yeah. Major League Baseball, they're like you're out for the rest of the year. Well, you got a team fifty out of eighty-two and four out of sixteen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Still, it seems a lot more serious. And then you know that baseball player is not getting paid as much as football player. Yeah. All right, so now we'll, we'll hit these throughout the, the time as we talk about metabolism stuff, and we'll look at some of these. Not all of these things that kind of pop up are, are ridiculous. Like, some of them are ridiculously applied. That one's ridiculous. Um, but as, as we'll see later, like, most of the, like, the little fad diets that pop up on your Facebook get divided into two things. They're either complete nonsense or their starvation, I suppose, or their, you know, um, stimulants. Crystal meth is a heck of a weight loss drug. Well, that's illegal, all right, so what can we do? Crap tons of caffeine um, and those other stimulants that you find in those like over-the-counter bills you buy at the gas station. Yeah, um, that's the pressure you have that because they fire that fight or flight response. So more on that way. So let's talk about our digestive system. Um, two big groups of organs, the, the actual GI tract, which is just the big tube that goes through you, starts the mouth, and then all the little accessory glands and organs on the side, like the liver and the salivary glands. The GI tract is one long tube. When you think about the, the gastrointestinal system and the actual GI tract, it's, it's a tube that's continuous, it's going through you. It's like the tube in the middle of the roll of paper towels. If you drop something through that tube in the middle of the paper towels, it's not in the paper towels, it's just passing through. And, and the digestive tract is the same thing. Anyway, anything that's in this tube from the, the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines, it's not in you yet, it's just going through the tube that's in the middle of you. To get in you, we have to absorb it through the walls of those intestines, and then it's in the blood. And this is another big point to make about digestion, is when we um, digest things and absorb them, we're not absorbing like big, giant proteins or molecules. We're breaking them down into little bitty, tiny bits to absorb. Because absorption is going to have to take place through the walls of these organs, the intestines, basically. We've got to go through those cells or between those cells in some way, and that's going to be limited to really tiny molecules. So six processes involved in digestion. The first is ingestion, actually bringing food in. Now, in neurophysiology, ingestion involves the mouth, and the esophagus it doesn't have to. And you put a feeding tube in someone, you put a feeding tube like straight to the stomach, and go through the nose, down the back. You don't have to use the mouth, but typically that's what we do. Propulsion is moving that food through the digestive tract. And then we have two types of digestion. Mechanical digestion is when we take big particles and we break them up into smaller particles. Like, think chewing. Chemical digestion is really what we think of as digestion. It's we're taking big molecules and taking them apart into their little bitty constituents. Taking a protein and breaking it into amino acids. Taking a fatty acid 
and or a, a triglyceride and breaking it into fatty acids or a carbohydrate and breaking it into to monosaccharides. And then when we break it down into those little tiny things, we can absorb it. Chemical digestion here is driven by enzymes. And remember what an enzyme is. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. It's going to speed up that chemical reaction. And it's going to, in this case, take something like, for instance, we can take that molecule of lactose, which is a, a, the sugar that's in dairy stuff, and we're going to break it down into a molecule of glucose and a molecule of galactose. The enzyme that does that is lactase. And everything here is going to be driven by enzymes. Whether we're breaking down proteins or fats or carbohydrates, there's a bunch of different enzymes here that are used in chemical digestion. Can't absorb lactose, but we can absorb those smaller sugar. Whatever we can't absorb at the end of it is lost, and that's defecation. So there's our process of ingestion, mechanical, chemical digestion, absorption, defecation. As we go through and we look at the different organs, one key thing to, to focus on is what processes are happening in what organs. For instance, in the mouth, you've got ingestion, obviously, mechanical digestion through chewing, mostly. As we'll see in just a bit, a little bit of chemical digestion, but not much. In the stomach, a little chemical digestion, still more mechanical processing, and then we get the intestines, we've got more chemical digestion and absorption, transport through everything. So we'll be walking through all these organs and keep your eye on those big processes and which ones happen where. Throughout the digestive tract, we're lined with different layers of tissue. The innermost lining um, is epithelium. And that epithelial lining is continuous with the outside world. So that means that at either end, the digestive tract is exposed to the outside. Anytime we have that, we have the risk of losing water. So we have to accommodate that transition to the external environment without losing that water. And then in the middle, as we go through the digestive organs, we have to create a barrier that's very thin, just like we did with digestion, or just like we did with respiration, because stuff has to cross. So this layer has to be really thin to get digestion and absorption to happen. And it has to tolerate, it has to deal with the number of cells that are going to die which is going to be a lot. There's a lot of chemistry going on here. There's acids, there's the stuff that you eat, there's physical and chemical abrasion going on. These cells die off. Luckily, they're epithelial tissues and epithelial tissues regenerate. So they're constantly regenerating. At the same time, while this layer has to be thin, we also have to protect the deeper tissues from the enzymes, which would digest them, or from things like stomach acid and also from the stuff that you eat. <coughs> and because it is continuous with the outside world on either end, all the bacteria that live here. How many bacteria? A lot. Better than 100 trillion bacteria live in your digestive tract. Most of them at the beginning and the end. But they're yours. We call them normal flora. They're like your pet bacteria. That's not even great. They're not even like pets. You're like a bacterial god. This, you're their universe. They live in your mouth. They live mostly in your large intestine. And occasionally, like as a vengeful god would, like you wipe them out with antibiotics just to teach them in bugs. What are they doing for you? Well, they're going to digest stuff that you couldn't. That's not always the best idea. It's not always good for you. Like we're looking at lactose. You don't want that to happen. You don't want those bacteria to digest lactose for you because they produce an acid and a gas. Um, but in this process of digesting stuff you couldn't, they produce some nutrients that we need, like vitamin K, one of the B vitamins as well. Bacteria in your large intestine do that. And they also fight off bacteria that might you know, be pathogenic for you. The thing is, is these normal flora are not 
consistent everywhere, it changes. So uh, if you go to Mexico, what do you not do? Drink the water. Drink the water. My first best said, came out. Um, I was like, also that, but it's drink the water is the answer I was going for here. Um, what happens if you drink the water? You get really sick. What's, what's, what's Montezuma's revenge? It wasn't water, right? You got the ice. Did you think about the ice? Or did you just straight up drink water? Oh, you drink water. Oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. The ice is the trick, but yes. the, yeah. Well, I got sick, I don't know from what, and then I was like throwing up and I was super dehydrated, and I was just like looking for something to drink. So what happens is those bacteria that are in in the water in different places, and this is not like like I said, it's not uniform. Like the people from Mexico drink? Yes, because our water is virtually sterilized. Okay. Like our water has, um, it's got bleach in it basically. But there's not a lot of live in our water. Um, but you go there, and there is like there are these pathogenic bacteria, and and they'll make you sick. Um, so it, it kind of becomes like a bacterial turf war in your intestines. You'll eventually win. Like your bacteria will just overwhelm this. But in the meantime, that little war, it's, it's going to suck right, for you. It's going to totally ruin your vacation. All right, so let's look at our lining of the digestive tract. The, inner, the inside lining there is epithelial tissue. We call it the mucosa. And in a second, we'll look at the different layers of the mucosa because it gets its own little layers. The submucosa is just after that. The muscularis, technically the muscularis externa. These layers of smooth muscle. And then outside the muscularis externa, we have the visceral peritoneum, also called the serosa. So we're working from the inside out. Now remember the inside of any hollow tube like this, this is always called the lumen. So we're working from the lumen out. The mucosa is the innermost lining of the digestive tract. It has its own three little layers. The innermost layer is epithelial tissue. Now it varies from place to place. And what type of epithelium? In some places, the epithelial tissue is going to be stratified, and in some places, it's going to be simple columnar. It just depends on the organ and our function. Past the epithelial layer, we have the lamina propria, this kind of beige layer there. And then the muscularis mucosa, which is a really thin layer of smooth muscle that's right on the inside. You see that here. That epithelial tissue will either be stratified or simple columnar based on the function of the organ we're looking at. The oral cavity, the esophagus, the anus, these are places where you're not absorbing anything. Ingestion, transport, no absorption. So here we have stratified epithelium. We have layers and layers and layers of cells. You don't want to absorb anything through all these layers of cells. That's there for protection. Where we have absorption and digestion, like the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine, well now that epithelial tissue is simple columnar epithelium. Because again, you just have one layer of cells to go through, not multiple layers stacked up. So just because of one layer of cells. So that's simple columnar epithelium. And through a lot of the digestive tract, especially in the small intestine, we'll also see those little projections on the cell. Those are villi and microvilli to increase the surface area. Anytime we see those adaptations like villi, microvilli, these sorts of things, when we increase surface area, we're increasing surface area for absorption. So in any organ that's specialized for absorbing lots of stuff, We'll see villi and microvilli. Just like we saw in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney, we've got those microvilli there because you're reabsorbing all that stuff really quickly. Past that epithelial layer, deep back here, is that uh, lamina propria. It's loose connective tissue. There's some little tiny blood vessels, some little tiny lymphatic vessels, and some lymphoid tissue. This would be your mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue that we talked about in immunity. That's a tiny sensory and motor nerves. 
past that is a very thin layer of thin muscle called the muscularis mucosa. When it contracts, it just moves the inner layer of the digestive organ that we're talking about. So we're not looking at like the whole tube contracting, we're just looking at the inner layer kind of moving. Past the mucosa is a layer of tissue called the submucosa. The mucosa is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. It's very dense, irregular connective tissue. It's mostly protein fibers. And we've got all those fibers. It's irregular, they're not like in a line, they're like scrambled up, and, but still most of the extracellular matrix are these fibers. We do see blood vessels there, it's connective tissue, so we've got room for blood vessels there. Um, some bigger nerves, and some bigger lymphatics. How tough is this tissue? It's tough enough that if you take it and you stretch it out, you can make guitar strings out of it. Whoa. You ever see those little Tom and Jerry cartoons where they run into like the violin factory and the cat freaks out? Because they used to make violin strings out of cat gut. Um, you can still buy gut strings online. Um, they're expensive. They don't. They sound weird. They sound old um, because that's what all the like string instruments used to have were gut strings. Uh, they don't. They also don't hold up very well, so they wear out in a hurry for such expensive strings. Um, they used to make tennis racket strings out of cat gut. I just want to know who thought of it. Like you see the cat walking by, and you're like, you know what? I better make a violin out of that cat. <laughs> you, see, you see the cat walking by, and you're like, tennis. There you go. It, it's just a really tough tissue, and you know you can spin that out and make strings. Again, I don't know who thought of that. Surgical sutures. Yeah, they they they've got sutures. Um, gut sutures are nice because they, they um, they're, yeah, they do, and um, they degrade. I don't want to. They, they usually don't use gut sutures. Like, like there, there are some times when you have to and some times when you don't use that. We, we've kind of gone past this now, right? Like, it's 2023, like, we've moved on. But you can still buy this, I'm saying. If you want to go buy a guitar string bit of the cat gut, they are so available. Yeah. Just online. All right, the nerve plexus here is called the submucosal nerve plexus. There are sensory and motor neurons here. The sensory neurons detect chemical changes in the lumen in the hollow part of the intestine. And the motor neurons are both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now remember what our function here for sympathetic and parasympathetic is. The sympathetic branch is fight or flight. So that's gonna be inhibitory for the digestive tract. And the parasympathetic is going to be um, rest and digest. And so that's going to be um, Excitatory. This innervates that inner layer, the muscularis mucosa. So we're just moving that mucosal lining. Past the submucosa is the muscularis, or more probably the muscularis externa. These are big, thick layers of smooth muscle. And through most of the digestive tract, there's two layers. The stomach gets three layers, but the rest of it, we get two layers. So as we discussed at AMP1, when we get these two layers, we get one layer that's circular. So if we have our, our tube right at the intestine, one layer of smooth muscle is running in the circumference of that circle, and like the muscle fibers going in a circle, and the other one, the fibers are running up and down like that. So when that inner circular layer contracts, the lumen gets smaller. And when the outer longitudinal layer contracts, the tube gets shorter. And we coordinate these two layers of muscle to create peristalsis. Peristalsis are those waves of contraction that propel something through the digestive tract. There is a nerve plexus in the middle called the myenteric plexus. So myo is muscle, enteric is guts. So this is the muscle for your guts and the nerve plexus there. Why does it have this? If the nervous system controls this, why does it have it? Because the nervous system, much like in the heart, it's got some control here, parasympathetic, sympathetic, this sort of thing. At the same time, the intestines, like the heart, can run their own show. They have their own little myenteric nervous system going on here. And there are pacemaker cells in parts of the small intestine that, that generate a sort of a basic rhythm, and we'll look at this later. That myenteric nerve plexus will have sensory neurons that detect stretching of the intestine and motor neurons that are both sympathetic and parasympathetic, so either inhibitory or excitatory um, neurotransmitters being released there that cause the intestines to contract or not. When 
Paracelsus takes place. If you've never seen Paracelsus, it's like a snake. Like when a snake eats anything, you see a fun little rabbit shake moving to the snake. Mm -hmm. That's Paracelsus. The weird thing is that there's more neurons in your guts than there are in your spinal cord. The only organ in your body that's got more neurons in your intestines is the brain. And most of the neurotransmitters we find in the brain are also found in the intestines. Serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, like all of these things are also found in the digestive tract. This often leads to some overlap between um, psychological states and physiological issues. So stress is associated with um, things like irritable bowel disease because stress causes that fight or flight response to happen. And that's also going to affect the intestines, not just your psychological. Here's Paracelsus, these waves of contraction. Now, the terms that you'll see here. Um, there, yeah. It just says food mass here. Um, usually the term that we'll use here for food mass is bolus. So the bolus is some sort of mass, right? Here, our food mass is a bolus, and so it's some sort of partially or undigested food. And what happens is the circular layer contracts behind it and the longitudinal layer contracts in front of it and it propels it through. And so that circular layer is contracting behind it and kind of pushing it down the line. So, waves of contraction moving us through. Peristaltic contraction. Talk about the generation of that once we get to the intestines um, next week. The muscle is thicker in the large intestine because it's the only place that's actually moving a solid product. Um, there's three layers in the stomach, and we'll look at that more as we get to each organ. Now, the outer lining of the digestive tract is called the serosa, or more probably the visceral peritoneum. Um, this is um, simple squamous epithelium and some loose connective tissue. We're not terribly concerned with this. It's just the outer layer. All right, so let's start at the beginning, at the mouth, ingestion, um, functions of the oral cavity. If you're here for dental hygiene, I'm sorry, we're not talking about teeth because teeth are gross. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, mm, that's a thing. So yeah, like disembowel people, whatever, let's put their guts back in. They lose a tooth, I'm gone. Check, I don't know. My kids, like, nope, let those teeth fall out, I don't care. So mechanical processing, chewing, right, or chewing, you know, um, and mixing with saliva. Now saliva's got multiple functions here. We're mixing with saliva so that we're liquefying it, and a little bit of digestion here. So mostly mechanical digestion, a little chemical digestion. There are two enzymes in saliva, um, one called salivary amylase. Right, uh, and always an enzyme, an enzyme usually ends in ASD, and this tells you what sugar it breaks down as well. It breaks down amylose, which is starch, and then lingual lipase. So uh, a lipase breaks down a lipid. Now there's not a lot here, like we're not fully breaking down carbohydrates and fats in the saliva, but a little bit, it kind of starts the process. Saliva is made by some sets of glands. You have um, three tiers of salivary glands that we care about. Um, we'll look at these, there's a parotid gland right here in front of your ear, kind of, some mandibular gland under your jaw, some lingual gland under your tongue. Um, the cells here secrete saliva, it's mostly water, kind of acidic. There's some electrolytes in there like sodium, potassium, a couple of enzymes, mucus, sometimes metabolic waste, uric acid, and then all the stuff that we'd associate with mucus, like lysozymes, immunoglobin A. This is protection against microorganisms that colonize your mouth. Your mouth is so full of bacteria. Like you could go do like the differential plate in micro and swab the inside of your mouth and swab that plate and you would be surprised at what's alive in your mouth. Like it's crazy what's living in your mouth. Um, but 
it's, it's, protect, it's prevented from getting to you because the, the lining in your mouth is stratified epithelium, so it's not crossing through those cells. And every time you swallow, you're sort of flushing all of that bacteria out of your mouth and into your stomach where it's gonna die a horrible death in acid. What we see sometimes is those bacteria grow out of control. And when they do, they'll rot your teeth out of your head. So you probably did this in micro too, where you saw the inside of your mouth and stab that citrate too. I mean, once you turn, I think the blue, to just do the presence of uh, the bacteria that are pathogenic for your teeth. Um, dental caries. Um, some people are more prone to that than others, in different flora in you. Um, some people then are more prone to cavities. We have people that are like, again, on things like methamphetamine where they have dry mouth all the time. One of the things that contributes to their teeth rotting is that uh, without that saliva there, the bacteria just run rampant. They're, they're not constantly being flushed out and they're not being um, killed off by the different parts of your immune system that are present here. So you swallow food, food's gonna go down to the parents. Now remember, just like we talked about with the respiratory tract, it's the common passageway for food and air. As food goes back to the mouth, it's gonna push the uvula back over the nasopharynx so that food can't go up and out. And it's gonna push the epiglottis down over the trachea and the laryngopharynx so that food has to get routed back there at the esophagus. The esophagus is a flat muscular tube. It's not patent like the trachea. It's flat. That means as soon as food enters it, it's gonna kind of stretch it out. And now we get peristalsis. As soon as that muscle stretches out, the reflexive action is to contract and, and push whatever's in the esophagus further down toward the stomach. The esophagus goes from the <coughs> laryngeal pharynx down to the stomach. It has to go through the diaphragm, and it goes through the diaphragm in a hole called the esophageal hiatus. You've probably heard the term hiatal hernia. A hiatal hernia is when you herniate digestive organs up through the esophageal hiatus into the thoracic cavity. Usually it's the stomach. The stomach pushes up into the thoracic cavity through that hole. It joins the stomach at the cardia. Inside the esophagus, we have stratified squamous epithelium. Why? Because we're not absorbing anything here. Stratified squamous epithelium is for protection. The esophagus is specialized for transport. All it is is a muscle tube. You're not absorbing stuff. You're not digesting anything in the esophagus. It's just going down to the stomach. There are, you, there are glands here to secrete mucus to help lubricate stuff and help move it down. The top part of the esophagus, the muscle skeletal, that's part of swallowing, and then the rest of it's gonna be smooth muscle. Here's the esophagus. Then, from there, food enters the stomach. Now, we're first going to look at the anatomy of the stomach. All right, so the first thing here. Here's the esophagus coming in. This region that's right here around that entrance of the esophagus is called the cardia. When we look at this in the lab, you'll see it, the esophagus comes in, and there's like a little patch that still kind of looks like muscle. That's the cardia, or the cardiac region. The fundus is this dome that's up here. The body is like here. And then it makes this curve down here, and this region's the pylorus. What? The pylorus. Oh, yeah. On the inside of the stomach, you can see this sort of characteristic ring thing in the stomach. Those are called rugae, just like they were in the bladder. Um, there are two curves here. The in inside curve right there is called the lesser curvature. So the liver sits here. And then down here is the greater curvature. And so the small intestines are down here. Notice here on this picture of the stomach as well, you've got three layers of muscle tissue. 
there is not just a longitudinal layer and a circular layer, there's also this oblique layer, which is diagonal. So the stomach is not just doing peristalsis, it's also kind of twisting on itself. The stomach just doesn't shove stuff straight through, right? It turns back and forth and twists and turns and mixes up food in there. From the lesser curvature, that inside curve to the liver, there's a very thin membrane called the lesser omentum. Omentum means apron. Um, and, and there's this little thin tissue between the, the liver and the stomach. The greater omentum is much more obvious. The greater omentum goes from the greater curvature and it drapes over the small intestine. The greater omentum, if we were doing a dissection, uh, we'd open up the guts and you'd grab it and just pull it out. It's really thin tissue, it's kind of fatty tissue and um, it's all this yellow garbage that's covering all of this. It's going from the greater curvature of the stomach across the intestines there. This all one tissue? Yeah. This one's already kind of moved away. It usually covers all of it. The lesser omentum we see there, it's a much thinner membrane between the stomach and the liver. On this picture, the greater omentum is cut away. Nerves to the stomach from the autonomic nervous system. Our sympathetic nerves come from the sympathetic trunk. We're not super worried about that. The sympathetic effect in the stomach is going to be inhibitory. Right, so remember this, sympathetic, fight or flight, so that's gonna be inhibitory. Our receptors for norepinephrine and epinephrine and epinephrine there. I think my beta two receptors that are gonna inhibit this vessel contraction. Parasympathetic, as always, to the vagus nerve. That's the excitatory effect. Our neurotransmitter there is acetylcholine. Binding to those muscarinic receptors. It's excitatory, the stomach starts to contract and do its thing. There's multiple things we'll get to in just a second. Blood supply to the stomach from the celiac trunk. We remember that celiac branches in the splenic, gastric, and hepatic. So this is the gastric part. It's drained by the veins of the hepatic portal system. So if you'll remember back to where we talked about the um, pituitary gland, a portal system is when blood drains somewhere other than the heart first. So in terms of like the pituitary gland, we have the hypophyseal portal, where blood went from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. Here we have the hepatic portal. So blood from the stomach and the intestines goes to the liver first and then back to circulation. That's our hepatic portal system. More on that when we get to the liver. Inside the stomach, we have different layers. We get an extra layer here because there's an extra um, muscular layer. And the mucosal layer, the inside layers, kind of modified because of the function of the stomach. So here we see our surface epithelium. There's still some columnar cells. Notice that there's no microvilli or villi here. So what are we not doing? Absorbing, right? The stomach is not meant there for absorption. There are some things that are absorbed through the wall of the stomach, things like alcohol. Alcohol is absorbed through the wall of the stomach. But for the most part, the stomach is not there for absorption. It's there for digestion. So we don't have the surface area that we get that we'll see in the small intestine. But what you do see is that surface epithelium has these little holes in them. They're called gastric pits. And they empty, and they open into these things that are called gastric glands. And we can see these sort of multicolored cells in there. Those are different types of cells that have some different functions. So the mucosa, simple columnar epithelium. There's a lot of mucus cells here. Those mucus cells secrete a mucus that traps a bicarbonate fluid between it and the stomach. That protects your stomach from the acid that it makes. So your stomach doesn't eat holes in itself. Here's our gastric gland, so there's our gastric pit, and these cells up here, these are mucus cells. So they're secreting this mucus on the lining of the stomach so it doesn't eat itself. And then we have this gland down here, and we have some different cells. 
we have parietal cells in blue, chief cells in this dark purple, and the occasional little green cell here called an enteral endocrine cell. As we said before, enteral means guts, endocrine is endocrine. So these are cells in your guts that are going to make a hormone. Our mucous cells, like I said, secrete the mucus that protects you from stomach acid. Parietal cells, chief cells, and enteral endocrine cells. So let's talk about what these cells do. We'll start with parietal cells, these weird looking blue ones. Parietal cells make hydrochloric acid first. The pH of your stomach between one and a half and a three and a half, that's really acidic. It's acidic enough that it denatures proteins. When we talk about denaturing proteins, remember that proteins are three dimensional like structures? Well now they're not, like we broke that. We break the three dimensional conformation of the protein in denaturing it. It also activates an enzyme that we'll look at in just a second called pepsin, and it kills lots of stuff. There's not a lot that survives this. The stomach acid is harsh, it'll etch metal. Um, if you ever swallow a dime, for instance, I mean, that's really specific, I know, but if you ever swallow a dime, um, when you get it back, it, it's a lot smoother than when it went in. Yeah, it took a week to get it back from that kid. The doctor's like, it'll go through, but he's like, you need to make sure that it does, so you gotta keep up with this a week. He's like, it should be two or three days, it's like a week. No, nope, no, nope, you gotta <laughs> sort through it. Sort through it. Oh, gross. It's like the world's worst slot machine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I might as well a dime, and like, we have this nice little x ray bit where it's right there, and then another one where it's further down, like the same one of the track it makes it run through. Um, and he's like, the, he's like, you know, the dime's gonna go through nicely. He's like, I had a girl last week that swallowed a second and be a dollar. And I was like, that is ambitious. Like, you gotta work, like, the dime, okay. Yeah. But the like the gold dollar the mouse, you yeah, gotta work that one. That's big. All right, so parietal cells, hydrochloric acid. They also make something called intrinsic factor. We've talked about intrinsic factors. We talked about vitamin B12. Intrinsic factor is necessary for you to absorb B12 later. When you don't make intrinsic factor, you can't absorb B12, and then you have pernicious anemia. We talked about that. When we talked about blood. So here's that. Intrinsic factor, hydrochloric acid for parietal cells. Chief cells make an inactive enzyme called pepsinogen. So remember, anytime we have that suffix, that's an inactive protein. Whether we're talking about you know, fibrinogen or whatever, here we have pepsinogen. This is an inactive protein. When that pepsinogen meets the hydrochloric acid out there in the stomach, it's turned into pepsin. Pepsin is a protease. And this is why it's an inactive enzyme when it's released. A protease is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Your cells have a lot of proteins inside them. You don't need that enzyme active inside your cells. You need it active out there in the lumen. So, Pepsinogen doesn't get activated in the pepsin until it's out there in the stomach, outside your cells. You want it to digest food, not digest you. So all the proteases are released in an inactive form and they get activated out there in the lumen of the stomach or the lumen of the intestines. The enteroendocrine cells are endocrine cells that secrete hormones. <coughs> we have things like serotonin, and histamine, and we have hormones like somatostatin and gastrin. We'll talk about the functions of some of these in just a bit. Those mucus cells secrete a mucus that protects the stomach from the stomach acid. If any of these cells get damaged, they have to be replaced in a hurry. The stomach acid will eat the lining of your stomach. The term gastritis is inflammation of the stomach and often it's caused by something damaging that mucosal barrier. If the stomach wall gets eroded by stomach acid, that's an ulcer, a gastric or peptic ulcer. And most of the ulcerations of the stomach are caused by a bacterial infection, even the pylori. 
irritated by some other things, but most of the time the bacterial infection is what's causing this. It's painful, and uh, it can be detected with a breath test because this bacteria um, produce uh, something that's going to end up. Um, yeah, you, you don't. You're not exhaling it per se, but it's going to come back up the esophagus and out the mouth. So you can test it on front of a breath test. Um, so there's that that H. pylori bacteria. And, and it's eating that mucosal barrier. And then there's the actual, that's actually a bleeding ulcer in the stomach. And the stomach acid has eaten a hole in the wall of the stomach. Treatment for this, you've got to um, kill the bacteria, and then you've got to um, reduce the amount of acid that's being produced, and maybe even provide a barrier there with something as simple as like Pepto, where you're gonna coat it and prevent that acid and give it some time to rebuild. They're epithelial cells, so they will rebuild. It's not a, it's not a big issue um, in terms of rebuilding, but you do have to treat it because it'll just keep getting worse. All right, so big picture, what's going on in the stomach? Physical digestion, right? Food is getting churned back and forth and back and forth. It's being mixed with the acid. That acid is denaturing proteins, and there is pepsin, which is a protease, so we're breaking down those proteins somewhat. We've got this big chain of amino acids and then we're cutting it into smaller little chains. We're secreting intrinsic factors so we can absorb B12 later. At this point, the stuff that you ate, the food products, is called chyme. Chyme is the liquefied food that's mixed with the stomach acid. It's, it's gross looking. Um, yeah, that's... I, without dissecting something right now, I can't show you this, but when you see it, you're like, oh, well, yeah, that's gross. That's what's going to go in the small intestine. Now, that's all regulated by different hormones and um, the different mechanisms in the nervous system. There are different phases of both stimulating the stomach and inhibiting the stomach. The first phase is called the cephalic phase. Cephalic means head. So the first phase starts with the brain. This is before you even eat. Like you're thinking about food. You think cookies look great. You're thinking about cookies. Now you're thinking about cookies. And your stomach starts to get prepared for this idea of cookies. That's also a very specific example. Um, after you eat, we enter the gastric phase. And then finally the intestinal phase. As the stomach starts to push this product through into the small intestine. So, cephalic phase, sight, thought of food, smell, taste receptors, vagus nerve fires, right, feed and breathe. The vagus nerve fires releases acetylcholine. That's excitatory for the stomach. So the stomach's gonna start, the muscle starts contracting and doing its thing, um, starts making secretions. Um, as you eat stuff, we enter this gastric phase, stretches the stomach out. Reflexive activity there. The stomach gets that stress relaxation response so that muscle stretches out and relaxes. And those internal endocrine cells release gastrin. The specific internal endocrine cells are called G cells. Gastrin is a hormone that is excitatory for the stomach. It causes the stomach to continue to make these secretions. Stomach acid, pepsinogen. And then after that, the stomach is going to start like sloshing stuff back and forth, and that little muscle right there is going to open, and you're going to start sloshing some of it forward into the small intestine. And this enters the intestinal phase. As soon as that happens, hormones in the intestine cause inhibition of the stomach. Because the, when you think about this, the stomach is not just like digesting all this stuff, and it's not like a cement mixture, and then it just dumps it all in your small intestine. The stomach is digesting all this stuff, and then it's putting it out a little bit, and then it stops and it's a little bit more, and it stops. This allows time. Your, your small intestine's gonna need time to digest and absorb stuff, so it's put through in little bitty, like three milliliters at a time. There are three chemicals that are necessary for sort of maximum hydrochloric acid production. Acetylcholine, from your vagus nerve, histamine, and gastrin. All three things have to be in play for the stomach to be producing hydrochloric acid at capacity. We can use this. 
We can block histamine. We can use antihistamines. Antihistamines will reduce the amount of hydrochloric acid in your cells directly. <coughs> That's not really what we do now, though. Okay, so when you think about stomach acid, stomach acid can be a problem. We can get the overproduction of acid. We have so much stomach acid produced that it starts to reflux back up into the esophagus. Mm -hmm. So we get, we get acid reflux, heartburn. Um, and so we can take a base, like an antacid, so calcium carbonate usually, and you take that, this is magnesium, and, and you take that and it neutralizes some of the stomach acid. You put that weak base in there, neutralize it. But we can also use long-term things. Um, you can use an antihistamine, or you can use a different type of medication called a proton pump blocker. So the way hydrochloric acid is being made is carbon dioxide is coming in. There's a carbonic anhydrase. Carbon dioxide water. There's bicarbonate. Or sorry, carbonic acid. Carbonic acid disassociates. There's a hydrogen proton, and our hydrogen proton here gets pumped out through the lumen of the stomach. There's our proton pump. Potassium <coughs> goes back in, but it just immediately goes back out anyway. Here's our chloride transport. This is our bicarbonate chloride antiporter. So an antiport means that it's moving in an opposite direction. We're going to move chloride into the cell. We're going to move bicarbonate out of the cell. That chloride comes across, hydrochloric acid. Awesome. Like your Nexium, Tylosec, whatever blocks that guy. It's not fast, but it works. But, big picture here, one thing to notice is that for every hydrochloric acid you make here, hydrogen chloride, you're putting a bicarbonate back over here. The way to think about this is you're pulling that acidity out of the blood. One of the things that we looked at when we talked about metabolic alkalosis, one of the things that could possibly cause that is you vomiting up stomach acid constantly. If you lose that stomach acid, your stomach's like, oh, well, I gotta make more acid. And it pulls it out of the blood. And so then your blood becomes more alkaline. You get this alkaline tide as that bicarbonate's moving back into the blood because your stomach's trying to compensate for all the stuff you just vomited out. And it takes a while before you get the metabolic alkalosis like that, but you, you could possibly do that. All right, so like I said before, the stomach stretches when, it, when food comes in. That's our stress relaxation response of the smooth muscle here. Also, as food goes in, the brain tells it to relax as well. <clears throat> there are pacemaker cells in the stomach. Now, the stomach would contract on its own about, eh, I don't know. I don't even know what the pacemaker rate for the stomach is. But the speed and the force of the contraction is influenced by things like gastrin, on the nervous system, or even how much the stomach is stretched out. Another picture here. Um, so three milliliters of time. So there we go. Moving forward into the small intestine. Okay. So one of the things that you've heard about is a bariatric surgery called gastric bypass. And a gastric bypass, you do just that. Reconnect. Okay, awesome. Why? So, weight loss. It's all weight loss. So, what's going to happen? Well, the stomach can temporarily store food, right? You eat food, the stomach can stretch out to accommodate that. Well, now you don't have that. The intestines won't do that. So, just right off the bat, you can't intake as much food, and you have to do it in smaller amounts, because there's nothing to stretch and hold it all. The other thing is that we cut out some of those processes, the chemical digestion part and the physical digestion part of the stomach. We're not prepping all that as much. So now when that undigested food goes straight in the small intestine, it's more difficult to break down because you haven't prepped it through the stomach. The stomach is taking those proteins, big molecules, and it's denaturing them, and it's breaking them into at least smaller segments so that we can break them apart into amino acids in the intestines. Now we can't do that. It's just not as effective because we're starting with a, a much more intact molecule. Same thing with like carbohydrates. Like they're not getting sloshed around. We're not getting that acidity. There's a lot of stuff that's not happening here. So what we get then is those bigger molecules come in the small intestine, and we're not going to absorb as much. 
by doing the gastric bypass, we're reducing the amount of food intake and we're going to create malabsorption of nutrients. Can't absorb it, you can't use it. So, you know, it's not going to contribute to What happens to your nutrition? Um, it's tricky. Um, it, a lot of it depends on the patient, but um, some patients that gastric bypass is great, and some patients it it's not as much. I, I know a guy right now that, that's struggling after his gastric bypass um, because he, he basically can't eat solids anymore. Like he's a friend who literally went from like three hundred to ninety seven pounds within like a matter of yeah. three months. She was hospitalized with so. it. Yeah, and it, it's difficult. Like you really have to keep up with your nutrition because um, like those proteins, especially like. The more complex it is, the harder it's gonna it's gonna be to digest. Yes. What like the stomach? Mm -hmm. They don't remove it. That's so what I'm saying. Like what it's happens to it? It's still there. It, it'll atrophy. Oh wow! But like it's still there, but they don't like to pop it out. Um, another thing they can do there is that gastric banding, right? So when they, like the lap band procedure, where they put a band around that fundus, and all they do there is shrink the size of the stomach, so then you can't hold as much food. Um, they, there's some of them where they'll take out like a part of it, um, and there's some of them where they'll even move that that esophagus. The connection will be even further down the intestine, so you get even more malabsorption of nutrients. And, and we'll look at that. Those are very drastic surgeries. Can you reverse it? I don't know the answer to that. I, w I was talking to someone just the other day, and he um, he had had this procedure done, and he was under the impression that no, but I don't know that that's the case. Um, I'd have to look that up to see if it's reversible. Um, it's like some things you can depend like how significant or what they've done. Right, so like how much of it they swapped out or they actually removed tissue. Yeah. yeah. What about like if you, like they pinched, like how you said they pinched off to make the stomach smaller, that you could? Yes, the banding, the banding yeah. is reversed. In fact, the banding, your stomach will, if you don't follow it, if you're not on a diet, like you'll adapt to it. Yeah. Um, that banding is not always successful. Um, today, however, like as we as we talk about that, like today, um, that sort of um, drastic bariatric surgery is is much more cautiously used than it was um, before, because now now we have other things that we can use to um, help patients who um, really need to lose weight. Um, the injections. Mm -hmm. um, so what do they do on six hundred pounds? They're gonna, like that 600 pound thing, I believe they do surgery there. I, I'm, I'm guessing. I thought they did that on the 600 pound thing. Do they, they do the a bypass? bypass? Yeah, so and it may even be like a, like a further down, like where they do a switch and it's a little further down the intestines. Okay. And, and I mean, so malabsorption of nutrients, yes, but if you've got. You're already malnutrition. Right, you've already got 600 pounds of nutrition on you, so. Like hypothetically, like you could you can metabolize that. It's effective, but it's it's drastic, um, and and there are lots of side effects to consider. Um, the guy I know that had it, like he's he's miserable. Um, he's drinking like the the nutrient shakes because that's all he can keep in. And he went from being like four hundred pounds to like he's probably one twenty now. Like, oh which is, so what do the injections do? We'll get to that. So the injections are, are typically for someone with type 2 diabetes, but they, they um, change the way that you metabolize fat. What are they called? I've been seeing Yeah, or, My stepdad's on them. Oh, Zimpic. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's one of them that's approved for weight loss. <laughs> Manjaro is not currently. Um, they're working on the approval. So, I mean, it's tricky. You can get a doctor to prescribe it for you, but your insurance company won't pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. the, the banding or the yeah. yeah. So that stuff goes in the small intestine. As soon as that happens, there's a chemical signal there, right? It's very acidic. And so those chemical signals are immediately going to cause a, a reflex, uh, this enterogastric reflex that inhibits the stomach and it stops pushing stuff forward. So it's gonna go forward, back and forth, back and forth, just little bitty amounts. 
Things that are very rich in carbohydrates, those are very easy to digest. And so that will move faster through the small intestine. Fat is a little harder to digest, and it may stay in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, longer. All right, so um, before we do the small intestine, I'm actually going to skip ahead here on your slides. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead um, just a bit to wrap up what we're talking about today. And then next time we'll come back and talk about the small intestine and the liver and such. Um, and we'll skip ahead and we'll end up with a different diet. So, um, so sort of the grandfather of all bad diets is the Atkins diet. Um, this started in 1972. And to give it credit, the Atkins diet really changed how we think about nutrition and it's influenced all sorts of weight loss plans today. Most weight loss plans today are based off of this principle. The idea here is that you restrict carbohydrates. Now before Atkins, and even after Atkins, um, the way that people dieted was different. Diet foods were high carb, low fat, right? You have a problem with being overweight. You don't need to bring more fat in because you're already fat. So just stick with the carbs. And that was what made sense, and so people were like, like rice and potatoes and crap. Um, and Atkins made the argument that if you cut out carbohydrates, <clears throat> by definition, you have to burn glucose. And you have to burn fat, because like you'll burn through your blood sugar, now you have to burn the fat away. Because, you know, you don't get a choice. <laughs> this is ketosis, this is what would happen in a diabetic. When you have no insulin, and you can't use that glucose, you're going to have to metabolize that fat as ketosis. You lose your, you lose right, you have to do, like, you can't die, yeah. right? and you've stored this for a reason, so let's burn it. So when the glycogen and the glucose storage are not available, we break down fat. We turn fat into fatty acids and glycerol. That's called lipolysis. We're breaking apart a fat molecule. And most of the body can full on burn that. It's called beta oxidations, and we break that. In the absence of carbohydrates, it's a little different. So um, we're gonna get in the Krebs cycle later, but we get acetyl-CoA, we make a Krebs cycle, yay, we make ATP, awesome. But if you don't have any carbohydrates, your brain can't burn fat. Your brain hates that idea. Right now it's thinking about it, no. Your brain, well, okay, so your brain can't burn fat. It needs glucose, you don't have any. We gotta find a substitute so that you don't die. And the liver makes ketone bodies. Ketone bodies will cross the blood-brain barrier, and the brain can use those. It gets converted into acetyl-CoA, it gets used in the Krebs cycle, and make ATP. It's not the best, like your brain's not super fond of the idea, but it'll work in a pinch. This is ketosis. So that is a sound principle. The only thing that becomes controversial about this is um, one of the later editions of the book made the argument that a low carbohydrate diet had a metabolic advantage. A metabolic advantage is the idea that somehow it, it takes more calories to digest something than you get out of it. Burning fat burns calories. That's never the case. There's not a negative caloric food. I suppose water technically, but I mean, because your digestive tract is smooth muscle, and smooth muscle is very efficient, you're not burning a lot of ATP. Like, your, your intestines are not burning calories for you. You're not losing weight by digesting stuff. Like, your really hard digestion. Yeah, your intestines are not giving you a workout. So, um, there's not really a caloric advantage to this. What happens is that eventually, people cut back on calories because they're trying to eat the same thing. The diet, as Dr. Atkins prescribes it, is under a lot of debate because some studies show that it, it helps with cholesterol levels and the development of cardiovascular disease. There are other studies that show that it contributes to cardiovascular disease and coronary artery disease. Uh, the high protein diets always, like there's always a risk of kidney stones. So there's lots of things going on there. The other thing that happens is that lots of people think that this means that you just get to eat whatever you want as long as it's not carbohydrates. And that's not the case. It's never been like a license to go out into the all-you-can-eat state diet and 
you could just, you're like, I could just eat bacon and cheese for the rest of my life. First of all, no, you can't. You think you can. No, you can't. You're like, I can do that. Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, it's a difficult thing to do. Because in the initial phases of the Atkins diet, you have to completely cut out carbohydrates. Nothing carbohydrate. You know what you like? Not everything. Meat, dairy, like like cheese, uh, cheese, yeah, cheese, meat, cheese, like. And, yeah, it is. It's fat. It's fat and protein, and you're limited to this. It's okay. So when I was in grad school, uh, we had a guy in our lab, and he had a he was trying to lose some weight for his health, and um, older dude, and and he's struggling. So like like we were all really close to the lab, so we're like um. We'll, uh, we'll do this with you. We'll stick with you. It'll be good for all of us, whatever. We could all do this. So I'm like, yeah, we can just eat bacon or whatever. It's great. No, you can't. Like day three, I'm like, I would murder you for a cookie. Like it, that drive for carbohydrates, like your brain is like must find sugar, like just eating it out of the bag or whatever. Um, you must find bread. And then like somebody would like bring up, they're like, these are carbohydrate free muffins. And I'm like, these are lies. <laughs> These are lies, they don't taste like muffins, they don't have, the, no, this is not a cookie. I will stab you for making this, like, it, it, makes, you, it makes you a little crazy. Um, it, it's tough to stick with, especially in the initial phases. And then you have to add back specific carbohydrates, like complex carbs, slowly. Some people, this works very well. But all of our carbohydrate restriction diets today have sort of been based on this. And today, like, even the more moderate weight loss plans, like, like Weight Watchers, they're all based on carbohydrate restrictions. You cut back those carbs, and, and we see success based on this. Um, and just watching the level of carbohydrates that you bring in. Because as we'll see next week, nutrients are really an interchangeable pool. We can, we can turn carbohydrates into fat, and we do. And we can turn fat into carbohydrates, and we will. So like we get this back and forth that can happen here. And by cutting out those carbohydrates, you'll end up having to burn the, the fat to keep your metabolism going. Um, in the height of this, in 2004, um, Krispy Kreme's sales plummeted. Nothing touches donut sales. Like 9-11, now nah, we're still buying donuts. Um, Atkins diet, donut sales started to slip off. Yeah, um, rice and pasta went down for the first time ever. And that had been like the staple of everything. Um, for those of you who weren't alive in the 80s, <laughs> shut up. Um, the food pyramid used to look a lot different than it does now. Like that food pyramid, like at the bottom of the food pyramid used to be like meat and like rice and potatoes and stuff. And now like that's at the very top, like used sparingly. Like my food pyramid is like just the very top of it. So I said, oh, I'm like, that's right, like the alcohol, the, the food, like the meat, the the bread, and then like the the rice and stuff. I'm like, what's all this other stuff that's underneath there? <laughs> all right, so this is where we're gonna stop for now. Um, we're gonna take a short break and we're gonna look at the lab structure. So you should have guts on a board on your table and we'll go over these. Um, I've only got, I'm limited on those. Um, so um, we'll go over this and uh, then we'll, We'll take off and I'll see you on Tuesday. So take a short break and I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. When's the